It is the far, far better thing that I do than I have ever done. It is the far, far better race I go to than I have never known. Greetings of the day, everyone. I'm privileged to welcome you all into the third edition of Orient City Literature Festival organized by SGI Knowledge Foundation in association with GH Raisoni University, powered by Raisoni Group of Institutions. I am Neha Tavrani, delighted to be your anchor for today's session. Writing Community Memory by Mr. Vu Po. Mr. Vu Po is an associate professor in the Department of English, English Shaheed Bhagat Singh College, University of Delhi. He is the author of Waiting for the Dust to Settle, a novel and literary cultures of India's Northeast Naga Writings in English, 2015. He has a PhD from Jawaharlal Nehru University and his areas of interest include Victorian literature, modernist literature, popular fictions, oral traditions, cultural studies, indigenous studies, and writings from the Northeast of India, for which he widely engages academically through seminars and conferences and publishing through various journals. He also writes at the popular level through the Hindu Habitone, Post Scroll Morum Express and Eastern Mirror, among others. Yu Pao's debut novel, Waiting for the Dust to Settle, is published by Speaking Tiger Books, and today he will share with us his reason for writing the novel. It's an honor to have you with us, sir, and I welcome you. Also, before moving ahead, I would like to take a moment and acknowledge the support of Speaking Tiger Publications as their associate is valuable to OCLF. Now, my dear audience, you are about to experience a very dynamic speaker. So without skipping a moment, I humbly invite you to lead us ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Neha. And uh, I want to greet everyone for this third Orange uh, City Literary Fest 2021. I want to also extend my, my thanks to uh, Mrilanili Nayak for inviting me on behalf of the Orange City Literary Fest. And I trust that uh, this has been an exciting one uh, in the last two years. And I'm told as I read the mail, those were quite exciting moments for us. And I also want to um, take into record and my thanks for Speaking Tiger Books for connecting me to Orange City Literary Fest. And so thank you once again, and let me just straight away dive into um, what I have to speak this afternoon, this morning. Um, waiting for the dust to settle, as uh, Neha already mentioned, is the my debut novel uh, published by Speaking Tiger Books. And um, for the last one year, I've been quite overwhelmed by the reception of the book. Now, for those of you who have already read my novel, um, you would clearly be able to see the intent of why I wrote the novel in the author's note that um, preceded the, the, the entire story that I wrote. But my large, largely, my interest lies in the, um, in, in, in the desire to write about um, uh, community memory. And this is where I'm going to expand and uh, talk a little bit more about this. Um, the larger... Um, theme which I am also trying to explore is, is on the, 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 the way we remember things. You know, today I think the, the larger scope of studying about uh, memory or memory studies have expanded to quite a good amount of interest from many corners. And, but at the same time, I'm also interested in how and why we remember certain things of the past. And why do we even remember or forget about certain things of the past? Now, I'm going to explore a little bit more about this, um, these three words, writing, community, memory. Uh, for me, writing is just a way of telling. So it is the method which I use to tell the story. I know that, you know, we, everyone uses different modes of telling their stories. Painters use their paintings to actually tell about certain stories or different art forms that people also see. And uh, so, and people also tell through the word of mouth um, for all cultures, oral cultures, this is the primary mode medium of expression, telling about things. And I come from an oral culture and therefore I understand the importance of the word of mouth because everything is more circulated in that mode and I, we see a lot of things which is still vibrant in large part of India you know especially the rural areas where 
uh, oral cultures is still dynamic and vibrant. And so for me, writing becomes a new mode of telling the story. And I also realize that there is power in writing because when we write, our writing, our works travel different places. Now, as I can only tell about my own experience, this, this novel that I have read, written, um, it has traveled to different places read by people whom I have never met. And that's quite an exciting experience because writing can actually enable us to um, let our stories travel to different places. And in, in, in the course of my interaction with young people, especially students in different colleges as I go around, you know, they read stories from different parts of the world. And often that can actually expand their imagination. So writing is one good method, which I thought is a way of telling a beautiful story. Uh, secondly, the community. Now the community is the subject of my telling. You know, I've used the medium of writing as to tell my stories, but I also use the community as the subject. Now, when I talk about the subject of my telling, um, I'm trying to say that um, largely I do not want only one individual to emerge from the story and fade, you know? I, I wanted the larger audience, which is part of the society. And um, for me, uh, as I grew up in a very communitarian society where everybody's affair is especially you know, open to the knowledge of everyone else. And that's how I think uh, close knit societies in many parts of, of India also does. So this, the community becomes the subject of my telling. Now, when I tell about how community uh, is the subject, I also mean that I, I'm, in, I'm looking at the importance of each individuals in the story and whose, whose, whose stories are equally important. I do not want just one protagonist to emerge from the story and uh, overshadow the rest of the things. So I wanted even the story of the grandmother. I wanted the story of, 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 um, of the young, young boy, of course, who was part of the story. Or I also want people who actually are affected by different kinds of conflict and violence. And yet at the same time, when I look at how people navigate through different changes over a course of time. Now, for example, I set the story of my novel in the last two decades of 20th century. Now, for, for many of the people who grew up in this part of the country, the 80s and the 90s were times of difficult changes. And yet these difficult times, difficult changes also helps them shape um, their outlook, their imagination, and also largely the kind of um, um, things that came, that individuals have to navigate through those courses to find meaning in life. Now, one of the things, one of the central focus of my novel is also the, um, or the incident which happened in 1987 called the Oyenam incident in local narratives, but also um, most famously known for the, um, the, the infamous, rather, Operation Bluebird launched by the Assam Rifles as a counter-insurgency operation against um, an operation that had happened in a small town, small, full, small village in Sanapati district of Manipur. Now, what happened subsequently was uh, how the common people suffered in a various kind of, you know, insurgency, counter-insurgency organizations. Now, the common people suffered from both sides. You know, the common people suffered from uh, both the, uh, the Indian armed forces and also the underground movement because they were left to, to grapple with different kinds of difficulties as they navigate through. Now, subs, you know, in a quick succession of events, what happened was that the, the year after this infamous operation happened in 1987, we also saw the unfortunate turn of event in this uh, movement that people loved to be part of, which is the Nagan National Movement. Unfortunately, of course, all those things brought about different kinds of conflict and violence. And I'm not here to actually cite any groups, as I mentioned, uh, as I write about this, but I'm largely interested in how people navigate through all those difficult changes, whether it's the operation from the outer surface or from the underground, you know, people actually are left to catch up with how they live on the edge because they're not sure what to, expect the next moment. And I wanted these individual moments, individual um, um, characters 
and their own own their own stories to actually emerge as one of the um, you know centers of the narrative that I also looked at. Now, of course, uh, when I just talk about the eighties and the nineties of 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 um, the last decades, you know, especially for many people groups in the northeast of India, um, you know, they have they have had to navigate navigate through difficult changes. Many of those come as modernization, as as agents of change because of modernity in one way, but also the, the difficult changes that came about because of various other elements that emerged from the within the society. Um, I was also looking at how uh, it is interesting to look at the transformation of a small town. Now, the one of the focus of this novel was was also the um, the, uh, the small town called the Senapati town uh, in the northern part of uh, of Manipur. Now, this district used to be called the Northern District until it was named uh, Senapati District for whatever reasons. Um, but uh, the, the transformation, as I come back, you know, often to visit this place, I could see the transformation every time I visit the small town. Now, and I think it is very interesting to actually observe uh, the transformation, especially of small towns, because what makes up that small town, you know, because this, this road that I talk about in, in my novel was also referred to as the National Highway 39. And um, earlier, you know, during the Second World War, this used to be the Imphal Dimapur Road, which actually connects the only road that used to um, Imphal and onward to Burma and others. So the Second World War was fought very actively in this lifeline that people actually navigate. And it, it is difficult to imagine how many of those past are actually lost um, without being recorded. And like, you know, because I'm um, partially from oral society, um, people have not quite thought the necessity of recording things. Now, of course, people have felt that, you know, we should start, uh, um, you know, uh, taking the, 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 the method of writing as a way of archiving. Now, I don't mean to say that, you know, the oral and the written are uh, contrary in nature. In fact, you know, like uh, the critic Walter Ong would say that, you know, both the written and the oral needs each other to supplement each other for the conscious for the for the development of the consciousness of human beings and i think that is what i also want to take forward by saying that even for an old society where i come from now because of modern education writing has become a part and parcel of their life and it is also important intervention in their life because that also helps them record things archive things and store become a storehouse of memory well, you know, in the olden times, it, it is the, the older folks who are the storehouse of knowledge because they are the ones who actually are knowledgeable about, about the tradition, the culture. But what is happening is also the, the swift and the quick transformation that has happened over a point of time. Now, of course, uh, that brings us me to the third word, memory. Um, memory is, is the resource of my telling. You know, I've, I've uh, come across, I mean, I've, I've kind of expanded on these three words. The writing is, writing is my mode of telling the story. I've experienced many of these things. Now, when I say that, I'm also talking about how, uh, how many of my characters are actually real life people. Even though, of course, I fictionalized them, exaggerated them by way of telling in a fiction, in the form of fiction, but I am also more interested in telling about um, individual lives because um, we we need to also acknowledge the contributions of all these characters, however minor they may be seen in the society at the moment, because all of them become a part of this whole society that we are looking at. And I think these experiences can be also the same elsewhere too, that memory can also become a huge storehouse of telling us about the past. And like I started out in the beginning, sometimes um, we also interrogate, why do you remember? Why, how do we remember? And I think that aspect of how we remember is also a tricky uh, thing to actually talk about because we don't always remember things about the past. We often remember some good memories. We choose to forget some things that happened 
that were not pleasant in the past. And I think it is this that uh, that becomes important because there are moments that the community as a whole, or the society as a whole, chooses to remember. For example, the incident which I mentioned about uh, the Oenam incident or the Operation Bluebird. Even today, even after uh, 60s, I mean, uh, 30, 30, more than 30 years after the actual incident that happened, people still commemorate that. The people who were affected by that, the community that were affected by that, still hold, um, you know, commemoration of that, uh, the bitter time, the memories that they have about this. Now, I think those are important because that becomes a collective memory. There are also individual memories and there are also collective memories. And I think these collective memories are important because what happened is that as a people group, you know, people who were affected by the Bluebird operation uh, continues to look forward to, 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 to a sense of justice that would come along. But unfortunately in 2019, the Manipur High Court even disposed of the case saying that, um, you know, they have no evidence in them. Now that was shocking because um, that was shocking because uh, all these 2022 volumes of evidence, you know, not just pages, I'm talking about volumes of evidences, how can that be lost except for some carelessness somewhere else? And that is where I came across an article by the, the, the first petitioner, the lawyer, Nandita Hakskar, uh, who filed a petition against uh, the, uh, the Assam Rifles at that point of time in Gohati High Court. And she was shocked that all this has been disposed of by the high court of the state, you know, after 30 years. That was quite shocking because what people were looking forward to was a sense of justice, a sense of, um, you know, compensation at least in, in perhaps in different ways. But those things seem to be, you know, lost in oblivion. Things to be, so, so this community memory becomes very important. But at the same time, I was also looking at uh, how different individuals become uh, part of the narrative by way of, um, by way of um, sharing the experiences. Um, this small young boy who grew up in that small town of Senapati in the northern part of Manipur in the northeastern state of India. You know, his experiences may be uh, very tiny in one way if you look at the larger society, but he also represents, uh, represents um, um, a huge population, you know, he is not just one individual, but he actually becomes a representation. Now, for example, he moves away from the state and he thought, you know, things would be better off uh, when he moves to the main lane uh, areas and go to studies. But unfortunately, what happened is also that he had to confront different kinds of prejudices, stereotypes, and including the unfortunate uh, racism that many people from the Northeast continues to face today. So you have a lot of things that, uh, uh, that uh, you know, come to, into these things. And the issues and um, the kind of um, struggles that people go through as we move along. Um, and uh, as, as, as I was writing it, I was largely also focusing about the sense of peace that never seems to be coming, especially for a people group who have so much struggled for a sense of uh, dignity solution to the whole, um, you know, the problem. For example, the Naga problem. Uh, as a Naga and also writing about the Naga issue, you know, I think, uh, let me just connect with the title of the story and then perhaps uh, come to a close. And I was looking at how, um, how the title, the waiting for the dust to settle is, of course, a phrase that, uh, an idiom that actually expresses about something that you expect and yet has not arrived. And also, I think uh, this is something which many people groups in the Northeast continues to imagine a sense of peace uh, or economic development or a political solution that pervades for many de decades and generations. But at the same time, I felt that it is important to tell these stories about, the, you know, whether it's a hope, a story of hope, story of disappointment, and also perhaps even the story of how we expected something else and somehow it turns out to be something else in the end. You know, I think because um, I think telling the story helps us to actually connect with other people who might actually be in such predicament, maybe not in the same region, but also from a different location. And that's where I think uh, I have, uh, you know, been quite 
fortunate to be able to come across and look into reviews that tells me that they were able to see different experiences as we move along. So, so that's what, and I mean, uh, writing the novel as such for me is writing uh, with a focus of writing community memory. And I want to just end by um, uh, reading the epigraph to the novel. Um, and this is a poem by Istirin Kiri, another Naga writer, uh, from the poem uh, Barcelona Dreamtime. And this is just an abstract, and I'll just read it and I'll conclude. I believe that stories are powerful. They have the power to transform lives, the magic to work peace. And then it is so important that they be told in any way, even in ways we have not thought of before, as pictures, as gestures, as dance, as song, in any way they can be told, reinvented, breathing life to new forms so that they can touch lives and work their transforming magic. And I think stories have power of way, of, in, in a way that actually enchants us, not just for children, but also for individuals and adults like us, because it gives us a power to imagine a world where we hope for what, look forward to, with the hope that things will be better. And I think we'd all struggle in our own societies for a better hope tomorrow. Thank you once again for this opportunity and um, over to Neha. What a beautiful yet interesting session this, this was. At the outset, I would like to thank Mr. Kamsar for joining us today. Wish we get to hear you again and again and be equally enlightened as we all are today. And for my dear audience, I'm sure that after witnessing this conversation, you all are taking home an enriched version of yourself, just as I will. Thank you for joining us today. Until I see you again, this is Neha Tharani signing off. Beyond.